Thank you very much for joining us for today's office hours. During this session, we'll answer a number of questions that learners said they would most like us to address. We hope by the time that you've finished this session that you'll be more familiar with a number of areas of global health. We also hope that you'll be inspired to explore some of these areas further. I'm pleased to be joined for this session by my former student and present research assistant, Ms. Rachel Strodel, who's now a fourth year undergraduate student at Yale. So Rachel, let's begin. Okay, so a number of learners asked important questions about data on global health. So let's start with two of their questions. First, is global health data accurate? And what are the challenges of obtaining reliable data? Thank you. These are, these are, these are important and valuable, uh, valuable questions. I think we can begin by saying to a large extent, the higher the income of a country, the more accurate the country's health data will be. We can assume, for example, that generally data from high income countries and many middle income countries is going to be reasonably accurate. However, because many low income countries uh, have weak systems for vital registration and weak systems for collecting and analyzing statistics, we generally have to assume that their health data is less accurate than it would be in middle income countries or in high income countries. Now, to compensate for this, many low-income countries, often in partnership with others, have developed a range of tools for trying to get more accurate health data. One important tool of this type, for example, is called the Demographic and Health Surveys. This is a survey on key issues in health, population, and nutrition from a representative sample of the population. UNICEF uses surveys to carry out a lot of its evaluation work, for example, including that to try to get an accurate fix on the rates of immunization coverage. And there are also a number of, let me call them, global efforts to generate more accurate global health data. Generally, we can assume that data collected through such efforts are good estimations, despite some important gaps due to access to data or to the methodology of the studies. The most important of these studies are called the Global Burden of Disease Studies, and they're based on models of the causes of disability and death in different countries. They also look at the risk factors for those causes of disability and death. These models take account of what the authors believe to be the best available data. The Global Burden of Disease Studies also model key risk factors, as I mentioned, for the causes of disability and death. Now, Dr. Prabhat Jha is a former colleague of mine and a dear friend, and his colleagues at the University of Toronto have been doing some very interesting work on what they call verbal autopsies with their million death study in India. This aims at improving the validity of data about the burden of death and disease in India by surveying families about the causes of death of their relatives and then having these survey data validated by competent uh, physicians and other people. In the end, I'd suggest that students and practitioners of global health use the most reputable and validated data that you can find. Always assume that there are important gaps in most of the data on poorer countries at least. Use your judgment to determine if the data makes sense and scrutinize data that seems unreasonable. And I'd also suggest you take a big picture approach to using data in global health. Don't spend too much time worrying about small discrepancies in the data you see. And let me give you an example, if I might, my, from my own experience about this approach. At a press conference in India many years ago, uh, a very excited journalist asked me whether or not the number of people infected with HIV in India was 3.1 million or 3.2 million. And uh, trying to be as polite as possible, I responded to the journalist by saying, I didn't know if the number was 3.1 million or 3.2 million, but I'm also not sure how much I cared if it was 3.1 or 3.2. What I was certain of, however, was that if the figure were anything like either of those, that India had a very substantial problem of HIV, which it needed to commit itself to addressing with a full heart. In many cases, I want to suggest that taking this approach to data will be the most practical one for you 
as well. Rachel, let's go on to the next question. Great. Several learners also have questions about how climate change impacts global health including how is climate change likely to impact health and how can such impacts be avoided or mitigated? The, the Lancet Commission on Climate Change issued an extensive report on this topic uh, of climate change and health in 2015. It's among the most comprehensive reviews to date on this question and I suggest that anyone interested in climate change and health take a look at the report. The Commission suggested that climate change could impact health through adverse changes in a number of factors, including air pollution, the spread of disease vectors, food security and nutrition, the displacement of people, and mental health. The Commission suggested that a number of steps need to be taken as a high priority to prevent and mitigate the potential impact of climate change on health. And very broadly speaking, these include a range of measures to produce cleaner energy, investing in research on climate change and the monitoring and surveillance of the health impacts of climate change, scaling up financing for climate resilient health systems, and supporting accurate quantification of the many benefits that could be associated with mitigating climate change. Again, I want to encourage those of you with a special interest in climate change and health to follow this matter carefully and probably begin by reviewing the report of the Lancet Commission on this topic. Let's go on, Rachel, to the next question. Wonderful. Julia Zhang asked what kinds of roles doctors can play in global health and what roles physicians could play if they're a part of an medical, uh, academic medical center. Let me begin by saying you don't have to be a physician to work in global health. But although you don't have to be a physician to work in global health, there are many roles that physicians can play in this field. Many people are familiar, for example, with the role in humanitarian work with agencies such as Doctors Without Borders. However, you'll find that physicians, among other things, are also involved in a wide range of global health activities. They carry out research in many areas, including the development of new drugs, diagnostics, vaccines, and medical devices. They engage in research and practice on health policy matters. They help train healthcare professionals in lower income settings, and they provide clinical services, most often in the lowest income settings. Physicians can engage in such efforts from a variety of platforms, including their own medical practice, a range of consulting firms, national health agencies such as the United States Centers for Disease Control or the U.S. National Institutes of Health, and from medical and public health schools in various universities. Many of the leaders in global health, research and policy analysis, in fact, tend to work from universities. For more information, I'd encourage you to consult with two chapters of my book, Global Health 101 that deal with careers in the global health field. The first is called Working in Global Health. It speaks about the competencies needed to be an effective actor in the global health field, how you can gain those competencies, and where you can be employed using them. The second chapter is called Profiles of Global Health Actors. It examines the careers of 21 people who are deeply involved in global health as examples that I hope can both inspire and inform those of you who are interested in pursuing careers in this important field. Rachel, back to you. Great. We also had a number of valuable questions on vaccines. Anne Colbert asked why WHO has not targeted mumps and rubella as part of the basic vaccine programs in low and middle income countries. She also asked if some countries are vaccinating with the combined measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. Vaccines are incredibly important and among the best buys in global health, as you know, and I thank Ms. Colbert for this important question. Let me begin by saying that most of the middle and high income countries have been using a combined measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine for some time. In addition, there's a global initiative now to eliminate measles and rubella, and more and more low and middle income countries are adopting the use of the combined measles and rubella vaccine. 
The World Health Organization issued a position paper on measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination about 10 years ago, and it's not been changed. What WHO has recommended is that countries should routinely vaccinate against mumps only if they have effective childhood vaccination programs and if reducing the incidence of mumps is a clear public health priority. Now, based on mortality and disease burden, the World Health Organization has considered measles control and the prevention of congenital rubella syndrome to be a higher priority than the control of mumps. However, in countries that decide to use the mumps vaccine, the combination of measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine is recommended. I want to thank my good friend Bob Davis of the International Red Cross uh, in Nairobi for his assistance with developing this answer. Bob, by the way, is a former schoolmate of mine and one of the really great authorities in the world on vaccine programs in low and middle income countries. Rachel? Okay. Next, Jan O'Brien asked, what is the best way to raise awareness and educate people who oppose childhood vaccination because of autism? Uh, another incredibly important question on this extremely critical topic of vaccination. First, let me say for those who are not aware that a substantial number of families in high income countries are refusing to vaccinate their children or they delay vaccinations out of a fear that vaccinations cause autism. Such fears in most respects started in 1998 with the publication in The Lancet of an article that suggested there was a link between autism and vaccination. The Lancet, however, retracted that article later as being unfounded and the author of the article later lost his license to practice medicine in the United Kingdom. Nonetheless, despite the lack of evidence, a complete lack of evidence of a link between va vaccination and autism, there's a persistent what we call anti-vax movement in a number of high-income countries. There's also now a growing anti-vaccination movement in some middle-income countries that in some respects looks like a spillover of the anti-vax movement in the high-income countries. This can be seen, for example, as we speak in a growing movement against yellow fever vaccine in Brazil, despite the terrible potential impact of that disease. In many respects, the anti-vaccination sentiments in low and middle-income countries have tended to be different from the origins in, in high-income countries. In Nigeria and India, for example, there was a substantial hesitancy among certain Muslim populations to be vaccinated against polio, partly due to some rumors that suggested the vaccine was unsafe or that majority communities were actually targeting an unsafe vaccine at those communities. One Northern Nigerian state, in fact, boycotted Nigeria's overall vaccine program for five years related to these kinds of fears. Now, intense efforts were made in both India and Nigeria, for example, to mobilize society around the importance of the vaccine. A wide range of stakeholders, including religious leaders, were brought into the social mobilization campaign. In addition, polio had a very low prevalence at the time, and the fact that communities didn't see polio as being very important uh, also led to vaccine hesitancy. Thus, the governments thoughtfully also made efforts to link polio vaccination with other health efforts which the community saw as a higher priority. These changes helped overcome hesitancy to vaccinate against polio and both Nigeria and India were able to eliminate wild polio virus. The World Health Organization suggests that the reasons for vaccine hesitancy are local and that they differ from place to place. Thus, WHO suggests there's no single intervention strategy that addresses all aspects of vaccine hesitancy. Rather, they note that the most effective interventions for promoting vaccine uptake are multi-component interventions rather than single component efforts. WHO further suggests that these interventions should focus on effective communication and directly target 
the unvaccinated or undervaccinated populations. And WHO further recommends that the interventions should address the specific determinants underlying vaccine hesitancy in each particular place. Well, this concludes our office hours. I want to thank again the many learners who submitted such valuable and well-stated questions. I want to thank Rachel for joining me today. I hope that this session has helped to answer some of your questions and further uh, inspired and excited your interest in global health.